Okay, so we're going to talk about shock in pediatric patients. Okay. Uh -oh. All right, I'm going to sort of define. Uh, I need I need people to mute themselves, otherwise I'll be okay. Good, thank you. So I'll talk about uh, defined circulatory shock. We're going to review. Um, the com most common etiologies of shock in pediatric patients, and then we'll review physiologic principles. So, if you mute, nobody is needs to mute themselves, please. Thank you. All right. So, shock is a syndrome that results from inadequate oxygen delivery to meet the metabolic demands of the tissue. So, if you think of shock, think of inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. So DO2 is delivery, VO2 is consumption. So you're consuming more than you can deliver or you're delivering, but you're not able to consume, okay? That's what you see with um, um, uh, sepsis. And if shock is untreated, it can result in metabolic acidosis, organ dysfunction and death. And that's why it's important to um, recognize shock early and um, treat. So regardless of the mechanism of shock, it is the oxygen, inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. You want to optimize delivery to the tissues by improving delivery or decreasing consumption. And we'll talk about that. I'll show you a schema to help you understand that. So if you think about, um, if you plot oxygen delivery against oxygen consumption, there is a linear relationship up until you get to the point where demand outstrips supply. So demand and, and supply. So demand is consumption, supply is the delivery. So there is a supply dependent portion on the curve. And then when you get to the anaerobic threshold, when demand outstrips supply, you get to the anaerobic threshold and then it becomes supply independent. So you're extracting more than you can actually deliver. If you look at it, there are many things that can affect delivery and there are many things that can affect consumption. So let's go through the consumption side. Um, so a, you know, your core temperature. So the higher the temperature, the higher the demand. Pain, anxiety, increased work of breathing, catabolic states, trauma and sepsis, all of these things increase demand. In terms of supply, how can we improve supply? By transfusing a patient. So remember that oxygen is carried around bound to hemoglobin. So if you can increase your hemoglobin con uh, concentration, you can also um, uh, increase delivery to the tissues. Um, also increasing your cardiac output. Now, you know your cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Things that impact heart rate will be uh, endogenous catecholamines or exogenous catecholamines, um, arrhythmias, and parasympathetic um, um, issues. Stroke volume is made up of preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload basically means the, how full the heart is. So the circulating volume or the venous capacitance. And uh, contractility is affected by catecholamines. Um, intracellular calcium is necessary for actin and myosin binding to cause contraction. And then obviously, if you have electrolyte imbalances and acidosis, you can have um, decreased contractility. And then afterload is the resistance that the heart has to pump against. So things that can affect resistance or the SVR or afterload would be the wall, ventricular wall stress, um, your, obviously your ventricular systolic pressure and the volume and geometry of the heart. These, all these things can affect afterload. So you can also classify shock based on the underlying pathophysiology. So if you have inadequate vo uh, venous return to the heart, um, we say that patient has hypovolemic shock. If we have cardiac dysfunction, we can uh, state that that patient has cardiogenic shock. 
If we have arterial vasodilation, you can see that with um, sepsis and um, distributive shock or anaphylactic shock. You can classify it also based on physiologic appearance. So warm shock versus cold shock. Warm shock, you, they're both, both, both types of shock or uh, physiologic type of shock have tachycardia in appearance, okay? They're both tachycardic. But where they begin to distinguish in warm shock, you have a flushed appearance, you have a brisk capillary refill, you have bounding pulse pressure, you have a wide pulse pressure, and you also have hypotension because it's causing uh, arterial, vis arterial vasodilation. So you do have uh, um, uh, supply to that side, but you don't have adequate delivery to the tissues. Whereas in cold shock, you have a pale appearance, you have mottled skin, you have delayed cap refill, weak and thready pulse pressure, a narrow pulse, uh, uh, weak and thready pulses and a narrow pulse pressure. So in warm shock, because of the vasodilation, you have a widened pulse pressure. In uh, cold shock, because of the vasoconstriction, you have a narrow pulse pressure. Both of them have hypotension and tachycardia. And then we'll talk about um, the um, uh, compensatory mechanisms of shock so that you can see why you have cold extremities because you have uh, blood being shunted away from the skin to organs of vital importance. Uh, in, in that scenario, that's where you see cold shock. You can also have loss of circulating volume with hypovolemic shock. So trying to define shock based on the different um, types. So hypovolemic shock is basically loss of circulating volume. So if you think about the blood volume contributes to preload. So your preload is down. And if your preload is down, your stroke volume will be down as well as your cardiac output and therefore your oxygen delivery. And your loss of circulating volume could be relative, a relative loss. So you third space like in peritonitis and burn. So you're intravascularly depleted but total body overloaded. You can still have a relative loss or you can have capillary leak um, as a result of sepsis or trauma or burns or, or surgery. Again, you have third spacing of fluid into the interstitial space and not and leaving the intravascular space. Or it could be absolute, an absolute loss of circulating volume as seen with hemorrhage or vomiting and diarrhea or other endocrine causes like diabetes insipidus where your, your urine volume is increased and you can result in, um, same thing with diabetes mellitus and adrenal crisis. Sorry. So uh, distributive shock, uh, we define distributive shock based on a control of the systemic vascular, uh, vasculature, which is lost. So you have a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. You can have maldistribution of blood flow as seen with sepsis and also results in inadequate tissue perfusion with normal or increased cardiac output. So you can actually have, sorry, Oh boy, I have to go backwards. All right. You can have um, um, inadequate tissue perfusion with normal or increased cardiac output. So you have vasodilation, you have increased cardiac output, but maldistribution of blood flow. Or you could have neurovascular control. So you, you see that with neurogenic shock or spinal shock. So a patient, a patient has spinal injury and they have uh, loss of the vascular tone, pooling of blood, and uh, decreased um, SVR and, and a drop in their blood pressure. Or you can see that also with anaphylaxis, with histamine release and the effects of histamine on the uh, neurovascular bundle. And then um, also in response to um, you know, cytokine release as seen in sepsis. What about cardiogenic shock? Cardiogenic shock is an impaired function of the heart as a pump. So the heart is not pumping. You can have either 
preload, your end diastolic volume could either be decreased as seen with hypovolemia and decreased cardiac output or increased if you have shunts, valvular insufficiency and yet your cardiac output is down. You can also have a high afterload which is seen with patients with obstructive lesions like coarctation of the aorta or aortic stenosis or hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So all these things can cause uh, pump failure. You can actually have also the pump failing from myocardial dysfunction. So your contractility is impaired and you have because of, of a direct injury to the myocardium as seen in myocarditis or you have poor myocardial perfusion as seen with Kawasaki's is the disease that has giant um, uh, coronaries or you have an abnormal coronary artery um, of the pulmonary artery, not of the aorta. So that's Alcapa. Um, you can have uh, metabolic abnormalities that can impact contractility. Remember calcium is necessary for acting myosin binding for actual contraction. So if you have hypocalcemia, um, the heart may not contract uh, very well because you have decrease in calcium and not readily available for acting myosin binding. Acidosis and potassium can also impact um, uh, contractility. Then another cause of cardiogenic shock could be arrhythmias. So you have alteration in your heart rate which will then result in decreased filling time. SVT is the most common cause that we, we um, that um, can produce uh, cardiogenic shock where you have um, a high rate, there's no atrial contraction, um, you see the heart moving very fast, so you have a decrease in filling time and therefore cardiogenic shock. Also, if you, people who do post heart uh, up surgery, uh, for congenital hearts for repair of the ventricular septal defect can develop ventricular tachycardia or junctional ectopic tachycardia and result in cardiogenic shock as a result of that. What about obstructive shock? Obstructive shock just um, implies that the forward cardiac output is impaired and it could be an inflow obstruction. So blood is not getting in as in pericardial tamponade or tension pneumothorax, or it could be an outflow tract obstruction, such as in pulmonary embolus, coarctation of the aorta, or aortic stenosis. So uh, you have an impairment of cardiac output either due to inflow obstruction or outflow obstruction. So the heart, the body has mechanisms that it, um, it induces to try to restore um, the balance to a new equilibrium point and to restore supply to match demand. However, uh, when these mechanisms are, are um, outstripped because of stress, you have inadequate supply to these tissues and tissue damage and lactic acidosis production. What are some of these compensatory mechanisms? We have baroreceptors in our carotid body and aortic arch that respond to pressure. So you have a decrease in vagal tone, therefore an increase in heart rate. So the first sign of a stressed heart is tachycardia because of these baroreceptors going to place. And then the sympathetic tone also increases and causes venoconstriction. And it is this venoconstriction trying to redirect blood from the um, skin and the periphery to the organs of vital importance. And that's why you have, you feel that you, when we talk about cold shock, the, the skin is cold, the capillary refill is delayed and the pulses are diminished. Then there are also chemoreceptors in the tissue beds that respond to hypoxia that cause vasoconstriction and respiratory stimulation. Then you also have increase in circulating levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine that try to increase myocardial contractility and increase the systemic vascular tone. You have ACT re release that causes increase in glucocorticoid formation and increase in glucose production to provide more energy substrates to optimize contractility of the vascular and myocardial muscles. 
you have decrease in atrial natriuretic peptide synthesis. And so you have conservation of water and salt. So the kidneys say, I'm not that important. I need to conserve water and salt to in, try to increase my, my circulating volume. You also have increase in renin um, release from the renal perfusion. So you have angiotensin being converted to angiotensin one, which then is converted to angiotensin two. And angiotensin two is a potent vasoconstrictor, again, to try to increase <clears throat> uh, circulating volume and conserve water. Then you have aldosterone uh, secretion stimulated by angiotensin two. Sodium is reabsorbed from the proximal tubule and along goes water. So water is reabsorbed and therefore all in a bid to increase the circulating volume. And then uh, the um, AVP uh, also results in a rise in serum osmolality and a reabsorption of water. Arginine vasopressin, I think that's what it is. So if all of this uh, fails, then you go into the decompensatory phase of shock where you, it results in cardiac failure and uh, hypoperfusion, tissue hypoxia, anaerobic metabolism and lactic acidosis and multi-organ system failure and death. How do we assess these patients? Uh, we can assess them for signs of low cardiac output and end organ perfusion because um, the the brain is affected. You have a decreased, depressed level of consciousness. So these patients can present with lethargy and just um, listlessness. Uh, your heart rate, as I mentioned, goes up. So you have tachycardia. You also have to feel for your peripheral pulses, whether they are present or they are uh, increased, depending on the type of shock. Blood pressure is usually the last thing to go. So you want to catch it early before you get to the place of hypotension, but you can still present with hypotension. Again, it affects the respiratory work muscles. You can get tachyp tachypnea. It affects the kidneys. You get decrease in urine output, as I explained from you know, the conservation of water uh, by the kidneys. So the urine output falls. <clears throat> the skin, we talked about that when we talked about vasoconstriction. So your, your, your your, your skin is cold and uh, capillary refill time is delayed. And then obviously um, you, when you venture into anaerobic metabolism, you produce lactate as a result of that type of um, uh, metabolism. So important thing to note is that repeated clinical assessment is so key in managing a patient with shock. Again, hemodynamic monitoring can be helpful, but when it's not available, you have to rely on the vital signs that you have to give you an indication of, of, of your patient in shock. What about the management of shock? It is important to note that um, you, you, the, the uh, management is predicated upon adequate fluid resuscitation to expand intravascular volume. Resuscitation is time dependent. So if you recognize it early, you treat it early, you can prevent the end organ dysfunction that arises as a result of inadequate resuscitation. It is also goal directed. So whenever you, you resuscitate the patient, you're resuscitating them to a goal. You wanna make sure that their heart rate comes down, the capillary refill time decreases, their blood pressure goes up, they're making urine, they're, they're, they're speaking or they're more alert and awake, the lactate is going away and your base deficit is going away. So you have to have a goal that you are targeting um, in terms of resuscitating a patient. I'd like to talk about the golden hour of shock. So. Uh, shock, just like you have the golden hour of trauma, you have the golden hour of myocardial inf infarction, there is a golden hour of shock where it is time dependent. The earlier you recognize that this patient is shocked, the earlier you institute um, um, uh, resuscitation, the better the patient uh, outcome. So compensated shock, you want to catch the patient in compensated shock before they decompensate and go into hypotensive shock. Because the difference between hypotensive shock 
and cardiac arrest is potentially minutes, whereas you have hours to resuscitate the patient when they're in the compensated, compensated phase, okay? So the, the children compensate for a long period of time and you want to catch them in that phase, reassess, re-intervene, reassess, intervene, so that you can prevent um, hypotension and therefore cardiac arrest. So what's the golden hour of shock? Within the first minute, you should recognize that this patient has decreased mental status and perfusion, begin high flow really oxygen and establish IV or IO access. Um, we, we say that according, this is a chart from PALS, so that's why it says PALS. So you, if you cannot get IV access within a few minutes, you institute an IO, just stick a needle through the bone marrow and you can resuscitate the patient. Uh, there's somebody else speaking. Can that person mute, please? I can use to transfer. Can you mute yourself, please? Bluetooth. Okay, so transfer the address. Uh, Dr. Deshion, can we mute everybody, please? Yeah, please. Dr. Deshion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm able to get it now. Yeah, I will. Okay. No, it's, it's not true. It's wrong. It's wrong. They sent it to me too. Can you, can you ask him to mute himself? Please, I can't, I can't speak over. All right, thank you. So within the next five minutes, you want to um, uh, give them IV fluids at 20 mils per kilogram of isotonic fluid. So either normal saline or, or um, um, Ringer's lactate. And you want to reassess after each fluid bolus up to 60 mils per kilogram until a, your perfusion is improved. Now, I want to make a comment here about the FEAST trial. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the FEAST trial that was done in Kenya, where it showed, demonstrated that uh, fluid resuscitation in African children with fever and prostration leads to death, okay? So you have to be cautious. You have to, you have, to have a, a keen sense of what is, actually, what is it you are actually treating. If the patient has sepsis, and you have clear documentation of sepsis, you can give fluid. If the patient has um, hypovolemia as a result of um, vomiting and diarrhea, you can give fluid. But if they just have fever with no other signs of shock, I would not give them fluid because that study showed that if you apply the principle that we apply with tachycardia and you know, uh, delayed cap refill, in that circumstance, it can result in death. So be cautious, be careful, try to define in your mind and have a clear picture uh, as to what it is you are dealing with before you administer fluids, especially if you don't have an intensive care unit where you can intubate that patient and uh, you know, uh, diarrhea the patient, then you can cause problems. Now, moving on, within the next 15 minutes, if the patient has fluid refractory shock, you should move on to a vasopressor or an inotrope, depending on what it is you are trying to, um, what type of shock that the patient has. Um, at this point, you should also consider intubating this patient um, for, um, for that reason, because you want to diminish the um, effects of shock on the working respiratory muscles. And so you titrate epinephrine for cold shock. If you don't have epinephrine, you can use dopamine, but dopamine is not a, a great drug, a great um, vasopressor to use. You'd rather use epinephrine because um, epinephrine is beta one, beta two, and beta one receptors are in the heart, and you can use low dose dopamine, a uh, low dose epinephrine or adrenaline for uh, cold shock. For warm shock, since it's a, a problem with vasodilation, uh, arterial vasodilation, you want to use no adrenaline 
in the treatment of warm shock. Now, if you don't have no adrenaline, you can also use dopamine. Okay. All right. So within 60 minutes, if the patient has catecholamine resistance, so they've had fluid refractory shock and you've escalated on your catecholamines and they have catecholamine resistant shock, then you reassess and you say, okay, does this patient have adrenal insufficiency? If they have adrenal insufficiency, then you should consider hydrocortisone. Okay, so summarizing, you know, for a normal blood pressure, cold shock, epinephrine on adrenaline is a drug of choice. For low blood pressure, cold shock, epinephrine or adrenaline is a drug of choice. If the patient has low blood pressure and warm shock, then no adrenaline is the drug of choice. So you see the difference? Warm shock, you think of a vaso constrictor. Cold shock, we think of an inotrope, okay? In which case, epinephrine is the best inotrope. If they have persistent catecholamine resistant shock, then you, you know, if you're in, a, um, in an environment where you have extracorporeal membrane or oxygenation, then you move on to that. If not, um, you keep doing what you're doing. So specific therapy may vary depending on the type of shock. Immediate therapy should include assessment of the airway, administration of oxygen, and establishment of venous access for fluid administration. So if you think about it, airway, breathing, circulation, disability. Is my airway maintainable by simple means, either positioning or giving them oxygen? If not, do I need to assist this patient's um, airway by bag mass ventilation? And then circulation, what's my heart rate? What's my capillary refill time? What's the, the uh, pulse like both central and peripheral pulses? You know, so those are the things you work within your mind to tell you what's going on with your patient. So secure the airway early and intubate. Or you could use non-invasive ventilation. We've moved away from intubating early and using non-invasive ventilation. Like uh, if you have um, a BiPAP machine, you could put them on BiPAP as long as you, know, you can guarantee that they are oxygenating very well. Now, the movement from you know, non-invasive to positive pressure ventilation or invasive ventilation is determined by whether you have a, a ventilatory failure, in which case you have inappropriately high PCO2. So in the early phases of shock, the patient is tachypneic, so the CO, PCO2 will be low. But if the PCO2 is climbing, then that tells you that this, this patient is unable to compensate. They are, they're getting tired or fatigued. And so intubating them early would be important. Optundation, if the patient is optunded, they need a breathing tube. And obviously, um, resting the respiratory muscles because you have about 30% of your cardiac output is diverted to the res working respiratory muscles. So you do want to minimize that and improve, uh, increase your cardiac output. Then you have specific therapy for circulatory failure which could be directed towards increasing your cardiac output, normalizing your peripheral organ perfusion, just uh, knowing that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume is preload, contractility, and afterload. Your heart rate, you want to give positive chronotropy. So epinephrine can be used to improve your heart rate or atropine, depending on what, what you're dealing with. In shock, you don't generally use atropine, but um, um, if the patient has shock, you can use um, epinephrine as a positive chron chronotrope. Calcium also can also help, especially in newborn babies where they, their sarcoplasmic reticulum is not well developed. They are very responsive to calcium infusions as an in inotrope. And in newborns, cardiac output is heart rate dependent so that at the extremes of heart rates, they have significant um, uh, uh, low cardiac output. So a patient with SVT whose heart rate is in the 250 range can present with cardiogenic shock. Uh, 
<clears throat> and obviously a patient who is bradycardic can result in uh, inadequate cardiac output and can result in uh, arrest. Now, stroke volume, as I said, is dependent on preload, afterload, and contractility. And in ch older children, their cardiac output is stroke volume dependent. So that's why they can you can give them preload and they can respond, whereas giving a baby a lot of preload, they can result in volume overload. Preload augmentation, you want to restore the circulating volume. In cardiogenic shock, you want to be judicious in use of volume because it's a pump failure. It's not hypovolemia. It's a pump failure and the heart is already full. So if you're going to give volume, if you think they have some degree of hypovolemia, you would give like five to 10 mils per kilogram rather than the 20 mils per kilogram you would give if the patient had septic shock. Now, as I said, again, I want to reiterate the FEAST trial. If, you've not, if you don't know about it, it'd be nice to just go online and um, get that paper and read about it because it was a landmark uh, paper where the, a, a, a trial done in Africa, they had a large enrollment and they followed the, the, the protocol to the T. And the results were that if you just really nearly give volume, you could cause significant morbidity and mortality. But again, you have to define what you are treating, you know, before you decide whether this patient needs volume or not. Obviously, the systemic vascular resistance is the afterload. You want to restore vascular tone, especially if you have vasodilatory shock like anaphylaxis, distributive shock like sepsis, you want to use vasoconstrictors. Now, if you have reduced afterload, uh, if you have vasoconstriction as seen with cold shock, then you want to reduce the afterload with vasodilators like milrinone or nitroprusside to try to improve um, um, cardiac output and help that heart pump against a lower resistance. And then, as I said, inotropes <coughs> impact contractility, correct your calcium, your glucose, and your potassium to help with ino uh, contractility. Now, um, just to think about the cardiovascular effects of shock in terms of cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, blood pressure, CVP, central venous pressure, I'll leave the left atrial pressure aside because we don't usually measure central uh, left atrial pressure. And in, in children, you assume that the left atrial pressure is similar to the central venous pressure since they don't always have isolated heart disease. So in hypovolemia, it's a matter of your cardiac output is low because your heart is empty. So your central venous pressure will be low and your blood pressure obviously will be low if you're in the, the hypotensive phase of shock. Your SVR will be high to try to maintain your blood pressure until the last minute. Same thing with cardiogenic shock, but in the difference between hypovolemia and cardiogenic shock is that the central venous pressure in cardiogenic shock is high, whereas the central venous pressure is low. So if you have a high central venous pressure as evidenced by either pulmonary edema or your liver is down to the pelvis and you hear crackles, then you know that that heart is full and giving volume to that heart is not the right thing to do. With sepsis, again, similar to hypovolemia, your central venous pressure is low because you have pulling a third spacing of, 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 of um, fluid. You know, you have arterial vasodilation, you have decreased venous return to the heart, you have a, 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 a decrease in your SVR and your blood pressure is low. Now, why is it that the blood pressure is the last thing to go in pediatric patients. That's because their SVR goes up to maintain their cardiac output, but their cardiac output goes down. So your, 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 your SVR is up, maintaining your blood pressure onto the last minute as your cardiac output falls and your heart rate goes up. So hypotension is a late finding in shock in pediatric patients. So you have to be, by the time you get to the hypotensive phase, you are in decompensated shock and it's almost late, but you can still resuscitate the patient, but try not to get to that point. Try to be 
recognize it early. This is a good schema just to show you that, you know, if your heart is empty or full, you're dealing with preload. And how do you know your heart is full? You can get a chest X-ray and see that, you know, you have a widened out chest X-ray with pulmonary edema, your heart is full. Or if you get an echocardiogram and look at the IVC caliber, if you see narrowing in the IVC, you know that the heart is empty. If you see a wide out uh, SVC, uh, sorry, wide IVC, you know that your heart is full. Again, you can look at an echo, simple way of looking at contractility to help you know whether your your heart is relaxing very well, whether you have systolic or diastolic dysfunction. Then your afterload, a quick way of looking at afterload is looking at capillary refill time as well as the coolness or warmth of the extremity. If the extremity is warm, usually you have a decreased afterload. If the extremity is cold, usually you have a high afterload. And obviously look at the rhythm of the heart. What about monitoring these patients? <laughs> It's important to monitor them if you can monitor them, but you also have to do your physical exam because your physical exam can also give you a window into what's going on with the patient. Blood pressure is a poor indicator of cardiac output, so I will not rely on blood pressure. Shock is under-recognized and therefore treated late and can result in ischemic damage, uh, significant morbidity and mortality. So the goal here is early recognition. You want to look for early warning signs. You know, <clears throat> you, you, you really want to teach people about looking for early warning signs like tachycardia, like uh, capri, capillary, delayed capillary refill, like, you know, you know, other organ dysfunction, like listlessness and things like that, so that you resuscitate. So the keys to re successful resuscitation is early recognition, early resuscitation, early intervention, early organ support and early reassessment. So go back, every time you give an intervention, go back and reassess. Did the patient respond? If the patient responded, did they respond in the way that I anticipated that they responded? If they did not, do I have the diagnosis right? Is it an accurate diagnosis? So always first investigate. And then you resuscitate to a goal. So early goal-directed therapy improves outcome. If you say, okay, I give fluid, I should see my heart rate drop. If my heart rate doesn't drop, do I need to give more fluid? Is the patient still preload insufficient? Do I need to give more fluid? Or is, is the patient, is, is my heart trying to compensate because I have a, a, a cardiogenic shock and fluid is not the right thing to do? So you have to reassess every time you make an intervention as to whether your patient is responding, if they're responding, are they responding appropriately? If they're not responding appropriately, do I have the right di 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 uh, diagnosis? Because failure to rescue is defined as the inability to save a patient's life by not recognizing deterioration and failing to take measures to reverse changes. <laughs> so you want to do things right and do the right things. Now, I want to spend some time talking about teamwork because it's so important in the ICU setting or emergency setting or when you're resuscitating a patient. So when you're resuscitating a patient, resuscitating a patient, you need a team. It's a team spot. It's a team-based approach. Um, you have team roles assigned to the patient, to everybody in the team. You recognize everybody in the team. You call out when, when somebody gives a fluid bolus, they call it out and say, I gave 20 mils per kilogram of fluid, or I gave X number of cc's per kilogram per fluid. If they give a drug, you call it out so that there is um, um, a, a, a shared mental model when we're resuscitating a patient because effective communication is so important to team dynamics. That's why in the PFCCS, we talk about direct method of approach. So detection, intervention, uh, reassessment, effective communication and teamwork. teamwork. So that calling it out, you know, um, uh, closed loop communication, all of these things are important in the resuscitative effort of a patient. And also there's knowledge sharing, you know, 
um, maybe somebody said something and didn't think about it and somebody else can say, well, what have you thought about this? Or should we be thinking about this? So that's the way the team works and can improve the outcome of the patient when there is a uh, uh, team-based dynamics. What about the vasoactive infusions that you use? Um, uh, just to mention again, volume resuscitation, if the, um, if the patient is in hypovolemic shock or septic shock, if they're in cardiogenic shock, you want to be careful with volume resuscitation because the heart is already full. Now, if you cannot get a PIV within, you know, a few minutes of the patient's arrival, then you should go for an IO, an intraosseous, because it is more effective. It is effective. It's quick and easy to put in, and it's very effective in resuscitation. You want to use epinephrine or, no, or adrenaline for patients with um, um, cold shock. You can use dopamine if that's all you had. Um, for warm shock, use no adrenaline and titrate to response. And remember, if the patient is not responding to fluid, so it's fluid ref, uh, responsiveness, is refractory to fluid responsiveness, refractory to catecholamine responsiveness, then you have to start to think about hydrocortisone or adrenal insufficiency. And um, with that, I will ask, I will give a, a one case scenario and have you guys discuss the case so that I can uh, see if my lecture was, first of all, are there any questions before we go to a case? <laughs> 